Wonderful. So now we'd like to move to the next one. The next topic is uh, mathematician L.E.J. Prabhu's philosophical view and the uh, Bhagavad Gita. And for this, we'd like to request to come on to the stage Dr. Ten Koster. So please kindly join us on the stage uh, from VU University, Amsterdam. I would like to give a short introduction of uh, Professor Ten Koster. <laughs> Professor Ten Koster, raised in Dodect in a mathematician and philosopher specialist in history and philosophy of mathematics. He is attacked uh, as an associate professor at the Faculty of Science of the BU University, Amsterdam. In 1991, he published a book about the philosophy of mathematics of the Hungarian English philosopher Imre Lagatos. Uh, with the French historian Luc Bergmans, he compared a detailed historical story on the relationship between mathematics and religion under the title Mathematics and the Divine. He wrote several articles about the role of geometry and uh, in mechanical engineering. In 2016, together with the mayor Len Albert Rust, he published the study Shooting, the, Shooting on the Moon, Authority of Resistance in Learn and it's in World War II. Shooting the Moon tells the story of Second World War on the basics of the events in learned at the time. With Inaki history he and Albert Rose, he wrote the uh, 2017 edition, Das Slag on the Berg Skating, the Battle of the Mountain Foundation, tells the story of Holocaust on the basis of what happened to the learned based Jewish children's home, the Berg Foundation. So let's welcome Professor Tin Kotz. very much. Uh, the, f the first talk was great, absolutely great, which uh, creates a challenge for me. You know, I prefer a lousy talk preceding mine. That's much better. I'm going to talk to you about uh, a famous Dutch mathematician. And first I would like to, well, explain to you that he's indeed a, a famous math mathematician. In the Netherlands we do have three looking historically three famous math mathematicians. There's Simon Stevin, but we share him with the Belgians because he came from, Belgi from Flanders. Then we have Christian Huygens, and then we have L.E.G. Brouwer. And I'm going to talk about him. Um, well, in mathematics you do have, I'll keep it very simple, you have uh, arithmetic, and you have geometry, and a lot more. Now. He is in particular famous for his contributions to topology and look at topology as some kind of generalized geometry. Um, maybe you've heard of his fixed point theorem. That made him famous. He, he made these contributions between 1999 and 1912, several fantastic papers, extremely rigorous. He's really one of the founders of modern uh, topology. Uh, however, he's also famous for another reason. Uh, he is uh, the creator of intuitionist mathematics, which is an original version of constructivist mathematics, and I would like to say something about that. Consider the natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five, etc. The last word was etc. What does it mean? Well, it means I can go on forever. And that's why we call the natural numbers infinite, an infinite set. Now, the word infinite in the philosophy of mathematics can have two meanings, and that's been a point of discussion for ages. One of the two meanings is that you mean actually infinite, which means that you believe that all the natural numbers are actually there, in a way. They're real, all of them. So what you're doing when you're counting them, you're just pointing at them, one after the other. That's a belief in actually infinite. The other position is that you say, oh no, 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 These, the, the actual infinity doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is potential infinity. So when you start counting, you're in a way constructing the natural numbers. And you've got as many as you've counted. And then there are tricks to speed the counting up, 10 to the power 10, etc., formal tricks, etc. But what you've got is always finite, but it's unfinished. You can always go on. But the actual infinity is, doesn't exist. That, that's what the believers in potential infinity say. 
Now, the believers in potential infinity are the constructivists. And the others are, uh, well, I'm a Platonist myself. I believe in actual infinity, but Brauer didn't. He was a constructivist. And the funny thing is that for, for centuries and for millennia, there was this discussion now and then between the two sides. And as for the mathematics, it didn't really matter. They did the same kind of mathematics. Aristotle didn't believe in actual infinity, just potential infinity. And Plato possibly believed in actual infinity. I think he, he would have believed in it, considering his views. But as for the mathematics, there was no difference of opinion. Now, Brouwer is really the first who realized that if you reject actual infinity and just accept potential infinity, your mathematics changes. And that's actually, from my point of view, his main contribution. And he developed his own version of constructivist mathematics in which a considerable part of traditional mathematics is lost. That led to a conflict, famous conflict between him and, and David Hilbert, etc. But I won't elaborate on that because I've only got 30 minutes till, or 27, till this terrible guy with a bell will intervene. So, that's Brouwer. And what am I going to tell you about Brouwer? Well, this is what I just uh, told you. I, uh, I will sketch his philosophical views because he was not just a mathematician, he was also a philosopher. A, in a way, a peculiar kind of philosopher, but definitely a philosopher. And I will sketch you the development of his philosophical, philosophical views and their relation with his mathematics. Now, as a 17-year-old boy, in 1898, he wrote, and in the Remonstrant Church, he read a, a profession of faith. He did not accept the, 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 the profession of faith that was used in, in the Reformed Church to which his, his parents belonged, because he was... Uh, a man who had very firm ideas coming out of himself. He, and, and he stuck to those ideas. So he wanted to write his own profession of faith, one he did believe in, not the one others had written down. It's a very interesting uh, piece of, uh, of text. I'll read you some parts of it. What is the foundation of my trust in God? And then he says, For the only truth to me is my own ego, of this moment, surrounded by a host of images in which the ego believes and which causes ego to live. So there's the ego, his ego, and there are the images. And he says, my life of this moment is my conviction of my ego and my belief in my images. This is directly bound up with the belief in that which is the origin of my ego and which gives me my images, which is therefore independent of me, something that like me, myself, is alive and which is higher than me, that something is God. So there's the ego, there are the images, but they must have a basis, they must have an origin, and that's God. And Brouwer believes in that God. This view includes my immortality, or rather it excludes mortality, for time as well as space are part of my images, of which my ego is completely independent. The images given to me contain in themselves, among other things, also the possibility of the existence of other egos. The possibility of the existence of other egos with their own images, but these are not real. They are part of my images and therefore of me. My images are my life. It follows that in the world surrounding me and part of me, I'm struck by its loathsomeness and that I want to remove this also from the human world. I can hardly call this love of my neighbor for I don't care twopence for most people. Hardly anywhere in human society do I recognize my own thoughts and inner life. The human specters around me are the ugliest part of my world of images. This heavy stuff, 17 year old. And he never changed his mind, I would argue, basically. In 1898, Brouwer was what I call an epistemological solipsist who found only truth in his, his own mind. But he was also an ontological solipsist, which denied 
the existence of other minds other than as suggested in the image, as the images in his mind. Now, an ontological solipsist is in an uncomfortable position because he basically degrades all other human beings to images. However, he is in this world, he participates in this world, he gives lectures, he becomes a professor, he proves theorems which others admire, etc. Yet, these other human beings he interacts with are only images, and most of them are ugly. This is an uncomfortable position. I, I, I was looking for images. So I found this one. Excuse me, miss, you've just disproved solipsism. There's no way my mind alone could have created something as beautiful as you. Well, just, I couldn't find precisely what I needed, but it's sort of an illustration of this uncomfortable, well, it's, it's easy to, to, to make it ridiculous, of course, solipsism. But Brouwer was a very serious man and a solipsist, epistemological, ontological. Ah, yeah. Then he goes to study at university. He studies mathematics and natural science. You, you, you study them together, but he concentrated on mathematics. And he read a lot. He read a lot. And at a certain moment, he was asked to give a series of lectures. Uh, he, they were published in 1905. And uh, they were given at, at uh, what's now a technological university in the Netherlands at Delft. And so he worked on these lectures, and basically he elaborated on his profession of faith. Again, a very ser a somewhat peculiar text, but very serious. And uh, Van Sticht, one of the biographers of, uh, of, of Brouwer, wrote, he was listening to the voice of his consciousness, studying the works of the wise, who in their search for knowledge did not rely on their intellect, but trusted their inner experience. The medieval mystics, Jakob Böhme and Meister Eckhart, and the Bhagavad Gita. So, listening to the inner experience, that's very fundamental in Brouwer. He was born as a man who wanted certainty, he wanted absolute truth. Where did he find absolute truth? Only in his own mind. Well, Life, Art and Mysticism was published. And, uh, but he read the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, my, uh, my image of the situation is the following. There is this, he's, he's 20, 21, 22 uh, years old, and he's reading these philosophers. His view is the, the view in the profession of faith, and uh, then he runs into the Bhagavad Gita. I, this is for the non-Indians, you, you all know this. But you, you must imagine Brouwer, he meets the Bhagavad Gita, and what does he meet? Uh, well, he meets a beautiful story, a, a, even an exciting story. There is this famous bowman, this famous archer, famous archer Arjuna, and he has a uh, coachman, a, a, a driver, the, a driver of his chariot, uh, and uh, he, they, there's about to start a war, an enormous war between huge armies. And the chariot is standing in between the armies. And Arjuna, who is a very important man, he actually doesn't want to fight. Because the, the, the leaders of the armies are related. And many people will die. There will be lots and lots of suffering. And it's, uh, the, the driver of the chariot is Krishna himself. And the Bhagavad Gita contains the conversation of the two. So I will have to quote some texts from the Bhagavad Gita. One day I'll visit this bronze chariot in Kurukshetra. Uh, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna what life is all about. So this is what the young Brower is reading. And think of a man who believes this profession of faith. O scion of Bharata, that's Arjuna, O conqueror of the foe, all living entities are born into delusion, overcome by the dualities of desire and hate. There are the images and the ugliness of the world. There is, however, a way out. Gradually, step by step, with full conviction, one should become situated in trance by means of intelligence, sustained by full conviction, and thus the mind should be fixed on the self alone and should think of not, nothing else. There's the ego from the profession of faith. He 
undoubtedly will have appreciated the text. And it's indeed easy to identify Krishna with the God in the profession of faith. I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who perfectly know this engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. I am the super soul, O Arjuna, seated in the hearts of all living entities. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all things. Oh, wait. Go back. So my conviction is that the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita confirmed the views that Brahma deeply felt and they corrected his ontological solipsism because the Bhagavad Gita is not a, a, an ontologically solipsistic text. But it also complemented his views, the possibility of liberation and a clear vision of how one can live a liberated life. That was a problem for Brower. All these ugly people, what should I do? Why should I live? How should I live my life? A bit like Arjuna, but differently. But Brower added, of course, new elements specific attention for the role of science and technology and language. Now, this is a, a list of the chapters in, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, in, in, in Life, Art and Mysticism, as the booklet that he published in 1905 on the basis of these lectures is called. The first uh, chapter is called The Sad World. The second chapter is called Introspection, The Fall Through the Intellect, The Reconciliation, Language, Immanent Truth, Transcendent Truth, The Liberated Life, Economics. For a very long time, this booklet led a peculiar existence because the collected works of Brouwer were published, but this is not part of it. One of the editors, Heiting, he said, no, 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 we're not going to exclude that, include that strange booklet. And indeed, it's a strange booklet, but in order to understand Brouwer, you have to read it. So let me go quickly. I won't take too much time. Go through the text. This is Brouwer's view of the world. Life of mankind as a whole, from chapter one, is an arrogant tearing up and devouring of its nest on this pure earth, messing up its mothering growth, gnawing and mutilating her and making her rich creative power sterile until all life has been swallowed up and the human cancer has withered on the barren planet. The sickness of mind which has caused this and which has turned men into madmen they call understanding the world climate change, plastic, you, you name it. He would have said, oh, see, I was talking about it in 1905 already. But his view of technology and science is negative. And he addresses the reader in chapter 2. Having contemplated the sadness of this world, look into yourself. Within you there is consciousness. And then he talks about meditation. In chapter 3, he identifies the culprit. That's the intellect that causes the, 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 the downfall. In his life of lust and desire, the intellect renders man the devilish service of linking two images of the imaginations as means and end. Once in the grip of desire for one thing, he's made to strive after another as a means to that end. The act aimed at the means, however, always overshoots the mark. Man's blinkered view prevents him from recognizing the sometimes very detrimental effect of such action. So you want to go there, you, you need something to go there, you try to get what you need, but that's already deviating a little bit from the goal. In order to get to, this need, to, the, to these means, you, you need other means, and his idea is that you might wind up going in the opposite direction. You want the good, and you're heading towards evil. And that's what's happening, according to Brown. This is simple analysis. And... and, and analysis indeed. Then the fourth chapter is about life after one realizes the corruptness of the world. You look on this life as the direction of your duty and you live it as directed from within the self. In other words, you recognize that all these earthly bonds remain your inevitable karma until God releases you. No new desires will be able to deflect you from your path and you will not wantonly increase the burden of your karma. I see here Arjuna doing what has to be done. And the same idea is present in this uh, text. Brouwer had a very negative view on, on, on language. That is, that's related to his, his inclination towards solipsism, and uh, particularly his epistemological solipsism. He viewed language as a very, very imperfect means 
to reach the mind of someone else. Actually, he, he felt that that is impossible. But, and, and mathematics, of course, could not be based, we'll get to that, on language, on such something as imperfect as that. Well, of course, the philosophers and metaphysicians, metaphysicians, they're fond of language, they do all kinds of things with this, but this is not Brouwer's ideal world. Uh, and in the end, he answers the question of true possibility of true communication with no. Then the, there is a chapter on, uh, on imminent truth. He discusses art. Art, which is real truth, belies common sense, causality, and science everywhere. It sees the avenging of fate in everyone's life, how the illusion, the hope, and the trust in the stability of this world is turned into misery. He views the right kind of art as positive because it, it, it reveals the situation we're in. And then he starts quoting the Bhagavad Gita. The truth, uh, he calls it transcendent truth, that is the truth that guides a man to a life free from the shackles of fear and desire. And then he quotes the Bhagavad Gita. One who works in devotion, who is a pure soul, and who controls his mind and senses, is dear to everyone, and everyone is dear to him. Though always working, such a man is never entangled. That is the idea. You're aware of the situation you're in, and then you can do what you have to do. A person in the divine consciousness, although engaged in seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, moving about, sleeping and breathing, Always, always knows within himself that he actually does nothing at all. Because while speaking, evacuating, receiving, or opening or closing his eyes, he always knows that only the material senses are engaged with their objects and that he is aloof from them. There's Brouwer's ego from the beginning and an explanation of this world of images. Well, now we get to mathematics. Uh, the profession of faith and life, art, and mysticism are indeed the background of his, uh, his views on uh, mathematics. Well, he did not only read the Bhagavad Gita, he also read Western philosophers, and my personal idea is that he in particular, particular read Schopenhauer, uh, also a German idealistic philosopher, also one who was interested in uh, Vedic texts in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, maybe he got to the Bhagavad Gita via Schopenhauer, but uh, in the, these, these German idealists, they have the idea that reality is, to a large extent, a construction of the human mind. Space and time, in particular, are constructed by the human mind. That idea returns in the case of Brouwer. However, um, in the, in, in, uh, at the time of, uh, of Kant, there was no non-Euclidean geometry. There was only one geometry, the, the theory of the space, the one and only space. And then in the 19th century, as we've seen yesterday, uh, non-Euclidean geometries were discovered. So Brouwer could not simply take the ideas of, of Kant and Schopenhauer, he had to adjust them, and he realized, and that's actually a simplification, he realized that all he needed was time. And his conclusion was that when you, the human mind constructs our experience of reality, the prime ordeal intuition, intuition of time plays the crucial role. There is a moment, there is a second moment, at which we still remember the moment before it, uh, Henk Barendrecht referred to this yesterday. This is very fundamental. It's actually the beginning of not only pure mathematics, but also of how we view reality. Causality is based on it. Something's happening. Happening is always, fault, f always followed by something else. So that is the beginning of a natural a law in nature. So his idea is that... Uh, Causality and space can both be understood starting from this fundamental intuition of time. And starting from this intuition, all of mathematics can be introspectively constructed. The natural numbers, the continuum, 
the geometries, etc. So for Brouwer, mathematics is introspective mental construction, and it has its basis in his philosophical views. Um, he rejects language as a possibility to, so he rejects formalism. And he also in, uh, rejects uh, logicism, because logic from Brouwer's point of view is based on the discovery of regularities in the way we use language. Uh, so there's language again, and cannot be used as a, as, a, as a basis for mathematics. So my point is, his intuitionism follows from his philosophical views. It all starts to make sense. Um, this is a sketch of, uh, I might skip it. Uh, the, the point is, these ideas stay with Brouwer till the end of his life. In 1928, at the bottom, he gives a lecture in Vienna, mathematics, science, and language, and there he does not elaborate very much on, on, on God or the ego and things like that. The, the mystical element is absent, but what is clearly present is the primordial intuition of time, how it leads to mathematics, how it leads to science. What is also very, very present there is the will, and that's one of the reasons why I believe that he was, to a large extent, uh, influenced by Schopenhauer. He views language actually as, uh, as something that mankind invented to impose one, one's will on someone else. That's the function of language. Well, very often, of course, we talk to somebody because we want him to do something for us. We want him to move in a certain direction. So, there is a, it's not ridiculous at all. There you see Brouwer. Well, he was a vegetarian. Uh, he, he, he liked to, uh, to sit in this uh, cross-legged pose. He slept outside often. Uh, he was, by the way, he was a very difficult man to live with. He was very sensitive, easily hurt. There's an anecdote of him with another topologist, De Groot, a Dutchman. De Groot had a Mercedes two-seater. He liked spectacular cars. And he took Brouwer from Amsterdam to the village in which I happened to live, but Brouwer lived close by, and, and, and the other topologist lived there too, in the two-seater. And then Brouwer started to count the to mention all the people he had an argument with. At the end, he had named the whole world of some uh, significance, and then he said, by the way, you and I also still have a problem. Then the Groot stopped the car and said, would you like to walk to Laren? So it illustrates the, the guy. Uh, he, was, uh, he had a very ne negative opinion. I, I skipped that negative opinion of, of women. But he was fond of women. He, peculiar man. Actually, in life, art, and mysticism, there are terrible pages on women. I will skip that. that that's, it's, it's really nonsense. You can understand Brouwer without accepting these pages. Now, the interesting th thing for me is that he, these ideas stayed with him till the end of his life. Because in 1948, at the International Congress of Philosophy, there were many famous philosophers. <coughs> he gave a talk called Consciousness, Philosophy, and Mathematics. And that was a peculiar talk. They published the talk in some sort of appendix to the proceedings, which is strange, because they had a section on philosophy of mathematics. It's sort of an indication that the organizer thought this is a peculiar talk. Let's put it in the appendix. Here, th that is Brouwer lecturing, dressed in white. Uh, the first sentence. First of all, an account should be rendered of the phases consciousness had to pass through in its transition from its deepest home to the exterior world in which we cooperate and seek mutual understanding. This account does not imply mutual understanding and in some way may remain a soliloquy. The same can be said of some other parts of the lecture too. So this is Brouwer talking to himself knowing that uh, they won't understand him because communication is actually uh, quite a complicated thing and po possibly even impossible. How does he continue? Consciousness 
in its deepest home seems to oscillate slowly, willlessly and reversibly between stillness and sensation. The initial phenomenon is a move of time. By a move of time, a present sensation gives way to another present sensation in such a way that consciousness retains the former as a past sensation. And moreover, through this distinction between present and past, recedes from both and from stillness and becomes mind. There is this element of time again as the initial, initial uh, element. Once the consciousness has become mind, it creates causal sequences. Some iterative complexes of sensations get estranged from the subject. This leads to the exterior world for the subject and then follow the mathematical acts, acts which we use the causal, when we use the causal sequences to change the world. Finally, by means of language, we transfer our will from individual to individual. So very, very, in a very condensed way, he again told what he, what he believed. Uh, I, of course, it's, I, I do not really understand how, how well, I sort of have an understanding, but I do not really understand how he, how he viewed the, the, this construction of reality by the human mind. Of course, the human mind, and what you think, has an extreme inf influence on, on how you experience the world. But a, a completely as a construction by the human mind, I find that a strange thing to accept. But this is what Brouwer thought about it. Come on. Oh, yeah, on solipsism. Uh, yeah, that's the, still the 1948 lecture. In default of the plurality of mind, there is no exchange of thought either. Thoughts are inseparably bound up with the subject. And by so-called exchange of thought with another being, the subject only touches the outer wall of the automaton. This can hardly be called mutual understanding. Only through the sensation of others' soul, sometimes a deeper approach is experienced. And when wisdom revealed the beauty of this sensation, find expression in the antiphony of words exchanged, then there may be mutual understanding. Apart from the soul, every expose on the sense and the essence of life is a soliloquy. This is his English. It, it was a, a lecture in English. And uh, then Brouwer returns to the question whether, whether we meet wisdom and truth in the transition from pure consciousness to the world as we experience it now. While discussing wisdom, he quotes the Bhagavad Gita. One who is not envious, but is a kind of friend to all living entities, who does not think himself a proprietor and is free from false ego, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self-controlled, and engaged in devotional service with determination, his mind and intelligence fixed on me, such a devotee of mine is very dear to me. Yeah, this is remarkable. Fritz Stahl is a Dutch, uh, he, he was at Berkeley, is a Dutch uh, expert on, on, among others, Sanskrit. And he, 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 he was present when Brouwer gave this talk in 1948. And he wrote later, Brouwer included in his talk a long quotation from the Bhagavad Gita, torn out of its natural context and placed in a new and totally unintelligible environment. Uh, he had been warned at the beginning of the lecture when Brouwer said that his talk might become a soliloquy, of course. My conclusion, Brouwer was a brilliant mind in search of beauty, mutual understanding, wisdom and truth, while locked up in a confusing, messy and often ugly universe. By the way, he definitely saw his mathematics, he was not interested in the applications, he saw his mathematics as a form of art. That's, that's how he could do it within his view of the world. He tried to understand the, the, la condition humaine, the human condition, and he found the answers in the solipsistic mix of Schopenhauerian philosophy and mystical religious thought. 
in Schopenhauer's work and the Bhagavad Gita, he found truth and wisdom. Uh, and it's, it's obvious that Schopenhauer's spirit and the Bhagavad Gita accompanied him his entire life. Uh, they, they, they say about Schopenhauer that he had a copy of the Bhagavad Gita on the table next to his bed. Well, maybe Brouwer had a copy there too. I, I'm not sure, but it's quite possible. He found truth and beauty in his mathematics, which, he, which consisted for him of introspective constructions. Introspective, later, of course, intuitionism uh, was phrased in language, uh, intuitionistic logic exists, etc. That, that, that's not really Brouwer's intuitionistic mathematics, but he, he, he liked fame. He was, after all, a human being, too, so he would have liked it, I guess. As for, uh, yeah, mutual understanding, that remained a problem for him during his entire life. I guess it's the end. Yes, I thank you very much. And the guy with the bell didn't show up. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Uh, if anyone having any question, then they can raise their hands up and they can ask. Any questions? No, uh, you don't have to ask any yes. question. Yes, the microphone. I'm never offended when I get no questions. Please. More than the question, it's a compliment, actually, I want to give. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Quetzer, for a wonderful uh, lecture and for bringing a good uh, understanding of Brouwer's work over his lifetime. That how through mathematics, he initially found it's a bit incomplete in the sense that he was not able to see beyond introspection. And for mutual understanding, he didn't have a proper uh, solution through mathematics. That's true. And then that's when he went and approached uh, you know, a different philosophical uh, path. And through Bhagavad Gita, he found the complete understanding. And that's how he, left, he laid his life for the you know, till time he lived. So it's very good because, uh, you know, this is the, uh, you brought a big, uh, I would say, connection uh, between the uh, mathematics and reality. This, which is the theme of the, uh, the talk, of the seminar. So I really want to compliment. But I also wanted to ask you whether Brouwer in his work ever realized God? Did he understand the origin of life from how the life came? Because you touched upon karma, so did he uh, find some realization from his work about what karma is about and how it works and how it acts? So if you have some idea about that, you can, you can just share that. No. Too. He, uh, he uses the word karma repeatedly, but he never defines it. It is, it, in, and, and the context is always that there is inevitability. You have to accept the situation you're in. But he, he, he doesn't elaborate on it at all. So, sorry. Okay. Thanks a lot once again. Well, thank you for the compliment. Thank you very much, sir, for the wonderful question. And compliments. Anyone else want to raise uh, and ask, please? Yeah. Sure. Uh, good morning, Professor. Thanks for the talk. So I have one question. You said that uh, Brava was a solipsist. He, did, he only he, he thought what he, he thought that his ideas were the ultimate truth. Then uh, why did he go on to uh, uh, read other German philosophers' work and implement them in his own theories? Or or am I flawed in my uh, understanding of what uh, an etymological solipsist actually means? You want to know what an no, uh, you said that... Uh, uh, yes, I use these terms, uh, epistemological uh, Yeah, you said, uh, you said uh, he was a solipsist, right? Then, um, uh, and solipsist pro pretty much means that his ideas were the ultimate truth. Then why did he go on to read other philosophers' work and implement them in his own, uh, in yeah, in his own work? That's precisely the, uh, the problem with ontological uh, solipsism. Uh, well, in his uh, profession of faith, he is an ontological solipsist because he, he explicitly says that other people are images in this mental theater of his. So they have possess an inferior existence. 
Now, this does not return later on. And my, although he never explicitly, that he didn't like to change his mind, actually, but he never explicitly said so, it is very obvious that he rejected later this ontological solipsism. Uh, I, I, I have no other explanation for his, what he wrote and his, uh, his, uh, his behavior. Because, of course, the, the question you're posing is, is, is absolutely uh, correct uh, for an ontological solipsist. Why would he engage in this communication? The, the whole of reality becomes an abs absurd uh, event in which you are participating. Why would you? No, no, his positive opinion about the Bhagavad Gita and everything else he, he says with respect to, uh, to uh, the, 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 his ideas about uh, mathematics, etc., uh, they show to me that he rejected ontological solipsism in the course of time. Thank you, sir. Thank well. you so much. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful talk. Uh, frankly speaking, this is one talk where we were uh, connected to the talk because uh, mathematics was totally uh, ruling in the first two lectures. But in this lecture, you know, we had some mathematics and some devotional, these things also. I really appreciate for the way we have presented uh, the thing. We are with the talk when you are going. I want to go for the one question what I had. In the conclusions, you have mentioned that this person is, uh, you go to conclusions, uh, he said that uh, he is uh, uh, intuition constructionism. Yes. Yeah. Then uh, in the last sentence you have mentioned that it created uh, some problems for him. But, um, would you repeat that sentence? Uh, it has led to some types of problems for uh, whatever uh, person you are speaking. But with, with Hilbert you mean? Yeah. Yes. Uh, why, after having such a knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, when he is able to understand the principles of these great scriptures, when he has good amount of intuition, constructionism, whenever we have constructions, it leads to positive things. Why it has led to some type of problems for this person? Uh, you, you want me to explain the conflict between uh, uh, Brouwer and Hilbert? Yes. Ah, well... Brouwer had become very famous with his topological theorems. And actually, they are not strictly constructivist. And Brouwer knew it, but he figured that he later, in some later phase, would be able to give uh, acceptable constructivist proofs. That's what he thought. Some have said that he was a little bit of an opportunist, that he wanted to become famous in the way that the world would accept. Uh, well, everybody is, from my point of view, sometimes a little bit of an opportunist, so that's, for me, that, 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 that's okay. But nevertheless, he was aware of the fact that his, his topological proofs were not acceptable, strictly speaking, from his own point of view. And then, when he had become famous, he had a perfect relation with Hilbert in Göttingen. And Hilbert was the, 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 the king of, of mathematics at the time. After the death of Poincaré, it was Hilbert who was the king. Uh, sitting in his, on his throne in Göttingen in Germany. Uh, and Brouwer became editor of the Mathematische Annale. That was the, the, the journal for mathematics, uh, uh, which was led by Hilbert. Uh, and then, after the First World War, Brouwer started to publish about constructive it, his mathematics. And it slowly became clear that it would be very hard to get certain classical results and that they probably would have to be rejected. Well, that was still okay. But then other mathematicians, like Hermann Weyl, for example, uh, started saying that they liked Brouwer's ideas and Hilbert considered uh, Brouwer at a certain moment as a danger for traditional classical mathematics. There was this revolutionary, it's actually called the Revolution in some texts. There was this revolutionary, well, the, 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 the Russian Revolution lay just behind them, you know, the, whole, the, the, the Russian Empire was taken over by the communists, and there was this mathematical communist with his extreme ideas going to finish a considerable part of traditional mathematics. And that is why Hilbert decided that Brouwer had to be removed from the uh, 
editorial board of the Mathematische Annalen. And Einstein was also on the board. Gara Theodori was on the board. Einstein was a bit neutral. He, he thought that Hilbert was exaggerating, but, but he did not really object. That was dramatic for, uh, for, for Brauer. That's, that's that part of the story. But I think, uh, I've, yeah, the, the, this was the last question, wasn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. I guess not. Thank you very much.